Hello, everybody. Nelson Virgil here with uh, ExcelMail.com and DiscountingLabs.com. We had a few technical difficulties a few minutes ago, but hey, we're back online with our good friend, Dr. Ramasamy from the University of Miami. He's being uh, a good supporter of ExcelMail.com. Uh, he really has been great at educating men about men's health, uh, hormones, fertility, and so on. So he's here to share the latest information and data on the subject of men's hormones and fertility. So welcome, Dr. Ramasamy. I really appreciate your being here. Thank you, thank you, Nelson. Um, Nelson and I uh, initially met when, we, when I was a fellow in Houston. Uh, this was now seven years ago, and uh, we've uh, stayed in touch since then. And Nelson's obviously been an encyclopedia of uh, men uh, taking testosterone therapy has certainly changed the way that uh, testosterone therapy has to be viewed uh, by men. Certainly this bad stigma that's associated uh, with men um, taking testosterone, I think Nelson's done a fantastic job in trying to uh, alleviate it. However, the uh, reason I'm here today and talking to you all today is I am a urologist and I specialize in men uh, who are interested in fertility. And I see this um, just about once or twice in every clinic wherein I see a guy that's coming into the office uh, that has been on testosterone and steroids and has uh, basically uh, cannot conceive. And nobody has ever told him about the side effects of testosterone therapy, how to protect himself from fertility, how to get it checked even before you start uh, testosterone therapy, and how uh, moving forward, what are some of the treatments you can do, what are the chances of recovery after testosterone therapy, what are the chances to conceive after testosterone therapy and so on. So I think the discussion today is going to revolve around the use of testosterone, steroids, and fertility. Uh, what are some of the factors that you can do? I'm gonna talk a little bit about HCG, uh, some of the research that we've done, and more importantly, uh, estrogen, and how important estrogen is in combination with testosterone in men. And so we'll get started. I'm gonna share the screen, if I can, Nelson. Yeah, um, scroll down and... Perfect. Yes, bro. there you go. And let's do a slideshow. You're a pro at this anyway, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll remain quiet, by the way, unless there are questions, uh, you know. That come up, yes, the... absolutely, sure. Or if you have any questions, certainly you can stop me sure. and ask. So um, I'm a reproductive urologist at the University of Miami. Uh, for those that want to follow me on Facebook, we were supposed to do this on Facebook Live, but we're now doing this on Zoom, so this can be shared on YouTube. Uh, you're welcome to follow me on Facebook. I'm a member of the Testosterone Replacement Therapy Discussion Group. Uh, certainly, if you want to direct message me on Instagram, that's my Instagram handle. It's my last name, Ramasami MD. And if you want to ask me questions, I'm happy to answer that way as well. So the goal for today, we'll start off with a case presentation, something that's similar uh, to uh, what some of you might be experiencing. Uh, this was a 26-year-old guy. He was a firefighter. Um, he's been on uh, testosterone therapy for many years. He's married to, newly married to his 24-year-old female. They've been trying to achieve a pregnancy for about a whole year. They first go to the IVF center locally in town. Uh, the wife gets worked up uh, with all of her blood tests and the ultrasound and so on. And everything comes back completely normal. And they're like, ah, oh, the guy's probably an issue. Go check it. And then his essay, which stands for semen analysis, basically comes back twice azospermic, meaning there is no sperm in the ejaculate and the guy gets completely shocked that he's been shooting blanks all these years, and he uh, is surprised, and, and he doesn't know what to do. So the wife is upset that he's not been, they've been trying for a whole year, and he's been shooting blanks. The husband's upset because he doesn't know why he's been shooting blanks, and there's so much panic. And so they come and see us in clinic, and the guy's healthy, right? Other than being a firefighter, and other than be using uh, testosterone for, for his general health, He's just a healthy guy. He's never had surgeries, doesn't take any other medications. And his testis volume, when you examine it, is 6 cc. So normal testis volume in men is around 16 cc to 20 cc, and his testes are small at 6 cc. And so you ask him a little bit more detail. He had gone to the men's health clinic when he was about 18, 19 years old, and has been taking testosterone cypionate intramuscular injection for about 10 years, every week. And this is what was prescribed to him at the men's health clinic. Nobody told him about fertility. Nobody told him about fathering children. Nobody told him about the potential side effects of testosterone causing infertility. 
they just said, this is great for your health. You need to start taking it. You have low testosterone and he's been taking it ever since then. And he's a firefighter. So he doesn't use this for competitions or anything like that. He um, had low testosterone because he wasn't sleeping well and he was prescribed testosterone therapy. So he comes to uh, our clinic and we basically draw some labs on him. The biggest labs that we will get in a patient who's interested in fertility, who's been on testosterone are basically four things. It's FSH, it's LH, it's testosterone, and it's estrogen. And his FSH and LH, as you can see here, are undetectable. These two are basically hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland that is important for sperm production and testis size maintenance, and both of them are undetectable. And his testosterone is a little high. He's probably using it a little, but maybe when he was using it, it was around 1,300 to 1,400. And now that he's off of it, it's on 380, he feels like shit. Right? His wife is upset. He has stopped his testosterone. He's shooting blanks. His whole life is in a panic state, and he just doesn't know what to do. And so one of the first, time, yes. uh, you know how long he's been off uh, testosterone? After this, he's been off of it for two months now. Um, one, of the, um, one of my primary interests started from when I was working at Baylor with Dr. Lipschultz, looking at preserving fertility in the hypogonadal patients. So when someone who's taking testosterone, what can we do to try and preserve his fertility either before someone starts testosterone therapy or then if they want to come off of testosterone therapy, what do we do? How do we make the patient happy, keep him happy, keep the wife happy, get sperm back in the ejaculate? There's so many competing interests over here that we need to make happy, correct? So it's not just like, go take your testosterone and everything's going to be okay. And so I think for all practical purposes for today's talk and for today's lecture, I think this is important. Exogenous testosterone, especially long-acting testosterone and steroids, is a contraceptive. It's not a good contraceptive. I can tell you that only two-thirds of the men who take testosterone therapy for six months or longer have azospermic. One-third, so 33% of men will still have sperm in the ejaculate and can still get their partners pregnant. So it's important to note that just because you're taking testosterone and somebody told you that it causes infertility doesn't mean you're going to have zero sperm and that's a great contraceptive. There can still be sperm in the ejaculate in one-third of men and so you should understand that they can still get pregnant. But two-thirds, which is basically majority of men that are taking testosterone, it is a contraceptive. It can lead to azospermia and you should just understand that it is a side effect, regardless of the dose, regardless of the frequency, regardless of how long you're going to be using it for, it is a contraceptive and should remain as such. Now, what are some of the options for uh, men who are interested in fertility, who still want to conceive? We've done quite a bit of research on HCG. And HCG now is actually uh, being controlled a little bit more by the FDA. Uh, but it's certainly a very good option to treat in men who wish to preserve fertility. So HCG is similar to the LH, the hormone that is made from the pituitary gland, and it can stimulate your own testicles to make testosterone. And some of the research has also shown, with Dr. Lipschultz has shown that HCG can be used in maintaining testis size. So if the testosterone from the testis is still being produced while someone is taking testosterone from the outside, I think it's important that if you want to maintain testis size, that that is a very good treatment option. And HCG can certainly be used to boost your own testosterone. They always ask me, they're like, Doc, can, we, can I do something to boost my own testosterone? My wife does not want me to take testosterone. They think I'm done with this. I can't go back on this. Can I do something on my own? And I think to support your own body from making, to, to make testosterone, HCG is a very good treatment option. It doesn't give you the highs and the lows and the peaks and the troughs like testosterone does. It doesn't have the dependent side effects like testosterone because testosterone is a steroid and you can de de uh, become dependent on it but certainly uh, HCG is a good natural way to increase your own testosterone as long as your testes haven't shrunk too much. If the testes have become very small, then regardless of how much HCG you pour on it, it's not going to make a lot of testosterone. In men who have good testis size, like 16 cc, 18 cc, and they wanna come off of testosterone, HCG is a very good option to boost your own testosterone uh, production and to keep the natural cycle going. I'm gonna- yeah, Sami, yeah. before we continue. Man, this is a real uh, tricky question that uh, I hear a lot. Um, you're a neurologist, obviously, um, and, and you know, your specialty is, is obviously men's health. But measuring testicular size is something most doctors, including urologists, do. Um, so 
should somebody that, in, like in this case, is going to start uh, HCG monotherapy by itself, should that person have their testicles measured uh, baseline? To, to Absolutely, right? Because you want to see if the, H, if the HCG is going to work or not, right? HCG should technically increase your testis size. And so if you don't know what you're shooting for, you don't know where you're going to end. You don't know if the medication is working because just HCG alone, the testosterone levels are going to be fluctuating. So if you just go based on T levels, you're not going to know if the medication is working or not. So yes, absolutely. I think it's very important to get your testes size measured because then in case you start testosterone, you know if that's causing your testes to shrink, correct? Because that's, that's a good trigger to understand, ah, my testes size was about 16 cc last year. Now it's about 8 cc. Maybe I should consider 8 cg because my nuts are no longer making testosterone. I, I bet yes. you over 99% of doctors do not do this so, <laughs> for, for this uh, indication. So, but right. anyway. Let's, let's keep. No, I think, I think it's very important. I think, I think at the least, I think men that are taking testosterone therapy should get a physical exam, right? Because unfortunately, I rarely encountered, thankfully it's rare, uh, I've encountered testis masses. You know, testis cancer is most prevalent in men younger than 40 years old. And so sometimes men have never examined their testes. They think it's normal. One testis is hard and the other testis is soft. And immediately when you palpate on a hard testis, you think of malignancy. And I've had to diagnose testis cancer in some of these patients with low testosterone. That's how it presents. Low testosterone, you have a testis cancer, and, and that's why you're not making testosterone. So uh, I think physical exam at least once by a doctor at some point, uh, if you're going in for testosterone therapy, low testosterone, definitely advisable and useful. So just let's go back. I think we, we're going to speak so much about FSH, LH. We're going to talk about HCG today, we're going to talk about Arimidex, we're going to talk about estrogen in men. I think in order to understand all of this, I'm going to take everybody back to a little bit of biology. And this is literally biology 101. This is the brain on the top and the testicle uh, cross section in the bottom. And the first hormone that's made in the hypothalamus, which is a very small, tiny organ in the brain, uh, which acts in the pituitary gland, it's called gonadotropin releasing hormone. And this is, this is produced by the hypothalamus every two hours. So every two hours, you get a pulse and it acts on the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland makes two very important hormones, which is basically FSH and LH. And LH acts on the lytic cells inside the testis to make testosterone. And HCG, which we commonly use, is LH. So basically, HCG given at this level will act on the testicles to produce testosterone. FSH, the other hormone that's made from the pituitary gland, basically supports sperm. So it's very easy to remember L for lytic cells and S for Sertoli cells and supports spermatogenesis. So you need both these hormones, FSH and L8, to basically have adequate testis size, adequate sperm production, and adequate testosterone from the testis production. That's the key. People always think they have very high testosterone, but you don't know where the testosterone is coming from. Is it from the testosterone that I'm taking or is it the testosterone that my testicles are making? Doc, are my testicles still functioning? Am I still making testosterone in there? When I come off testosterone, am I going to continue making testosterone? I mean, all of those questions are very important. And this, is, this hormone is what is very important to keep making your testes make testosterone. What happens here? LH basically stimulates the testes to make testosterone. Testosterone gets converted to estrogen and basically blocks the feedback on GnRH and FSH and LH. So if you take exogenous testosterone, it gets converted to estrogen and it blocks the feedback on the pituitary gland that makes FSH and LH. And that's important for sperm. So we often think that low testosterone, this hypogonadism, you know, happens in the old people, right? It's a, it's a very common thing. It's a disease of aging. As you get older, your testosterone will decline. This is inevitable. This is bound to happen, just like hypertension, just like uh, cataracts, just like heart disease. Just like this lipidemia, as you get older, it's going to happen. Two recent studies that we published here from the University of Miami showing that testosterone is actually a very common condition, even in adolescents and young adults. This is not a disease of the elderly. Even young people, because of obesity, because of occupational hazards, such as workers in security, um, that night shift workers, improper sleep, firefighters, police officers, who are all very young and work, have improper sleep cycles, uh, improper diet habits, in, in a, inadequate exercise can all have low testosterone. In fact, when you look at the testosterone levels in young men from 1999 to 2000, 
to all the way now to 2015 to 2016, we actually start seeing a steady decline. So this whole concept of, oh yeah, my testosterone level is, is low and it's only low, it's low because I'm getting older. No, we're starting to see more and more young men with low testosterone. And it is these young men where we need to think about fertility, correct? Because they're still going to get married, they're going to have kids. And I think that's why this talk today is so relevant because we're seeing more and more uh, of this problem with low testosterone happen in men of reproductive age, men younger than 40 that still want to have kids in the future. And before we continue, because that's a question that is very commonly asked. So it, we obviously are testing just, uh, men for low testosterone more, more frequently now than we used to 10 years ago. And this data that we just presented, uh, by the way, I just saw this abstract today that you presented recently, um, January 2020. Yeah. Um, and it, it, are these trends because we are increasing the number of patients tested? Or is this something that is happening to young people? I guess, you know, not sleeping well because of electronics, uh, watching, you know, movies or, or their cell phones. Are they getting maybe more obese, uh, gaining more weight, less, less exercise? What do you think? I know that's, that's a big question. I, we can spend hours. No, it's not, Nelson. No, it's a, it's a great question, Nelson. So, so I think you bring up a very good point. Are we testing more frequently? So this data is actually derived from a database called the NHANES which is the national cross-sectional database that the US government does, going and basically drawing blood samples from a cross-section of the population. So, so this is not, this is basically, so every year they decide to do uh, testing on a bunch of men and women, and it, it is the same number of tests that's being performed year to year to year. Obviously in different populations of men, but certainly it is the same number. So I don't think this is a prevalence as a function of the whole population because we're testing more, I think this is, so actually, so we looked at factors that of reasons why this could be the case. The only one factor that came about was obesity. So during the same time between 99, 2000 to 2015, 2016, the BMI also increased of this same young adult and adolescent men. So I think that's one certainly factor. Why are uh, young kids and young adults getting fatter these days? Everything that you mentioned. They're playing more video games. You're stuck more to the TV. You exercise less. There's less physical activity. You don't sleep well. Um, and you eat junk food and fast food. Maybe there wasn't as many McDonald's and KFCs back in 2000. We probably have a lot more access to young kids getting to those things, um, getting to those access to those foods, I think, way more now than we did back in the day. When we were kids, it was not easy to just go to McDonald's and get fast food. I think now the access has become so much more that I think obesity, uh, lack of sleep, video games, sedentary lifestyle, all that's happening in adolescents and young adults, I think is probably a reason for why we're seeing this. So I think this is a real trend. I think this, we need to follow this out to see if this continues. Uh, but, it, uh, but the exact cause other than obesity remains to be seen in this study. So the um, two drugs that we're gonna talk a little bit about today, and you, you'll see this thrown around a lot. You know, I took testosterone along with Clomid, I took testosterone with an astrazole. Um, you know, I, I developed gynecomastia, and so the doctor gave me some an, a, a, a Remedex, the estrogen blocker. What is it? What, does, what do these drugs actually do? So clomiphene basically is an estrogen molecule, and that's important to know. So clomid is just like estrogen. It basically blocks the estrogen feedback on the pituitary and the hypothalamus, and it increases the LH and the FSH, making more testosterone. So clomid helps you block the estrogen feedback and therefore increase the testosterone from the testes. The arimidex or the anastrozole basically blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen inside the testes, basically increasing testosterone. So if you have a high estrogen level, you'll be given anastrozole or arimidex even when you're taking testosterone therapy. This whole concept of using testosterone therapy along with Clomid, I'm just not a big fan because I just taught you in the previous two slides that testosterone blocks FSH and LH production. And here I'm teaching you saying Clomid increases FSH and LH. So I think when you have the seesaw effect, I don't know which one wins. And there have been any clear studies using testosterone and Clomid together. So I'm never a big fan of it. Take one or the other. If you're going to not be interested in fertility, take testosterone. And if you want tested size maintenance, or you're worried about losing your endogenous production, HCG is a good option. Testosterone plus Clomid, I'm never a big fan of and would almost never use it because Clomid, remember, is an estrogen molecule. 
it's being used in females, it is used off label in males. And so therefore you, you will start seeing, men will start seeing side effects of Clomid when you use long-term because estrogen is an estrogen and Clomid is an estrogen. It'll cause gynecomastia, fluid retention, fatigue and weight gain. So uh, be careful when you're taking Clomid, it shouldn't be used for long-term, especially indiscriminately used. Beautiful study. As much as I hated Clomid and I said it's an estrogen, estrogen is important for men, just not too high, not too low. I think it has to be optimal. And one of the best studies that has come out so far showing that estrogen is critical for men to have both erectile function as well as libido came out of Boston. Finkelstein basically took a whole bunch of young 18, uh, 18 year old and above college going kids and gave them Lupron. Lupron is actually given for men with prostate cancer, which basically shuts down your FSH and LH production. How he did it, how they got IRB, mm -hmm. don't know. But mm -hmm. young kids were given Lupron, which will basically chemically castrate them. So no testosterone production from these men at all. And they were gone and, give, and then they were given testosterone gels. So this is all gel study in one cohort. So 100 kids got just testosterone. In the other group, they gave testosterone along with Arimidex. So 100 people got testosterone with Arimidex. In the group that got the Arimidex, they basically showed sexual desire was a lot worse than in the group that just got testosterone. Same thing, erectile function was a lot worse than in the group that just got testosterone. Very nice, elegant study to show that estrogen is very important in men. It's important in bone health. I think everybody agrees to that, but it's certainly important for the boners as well. And so we went and back and, and I wrote a very nice review article detailing all of the effects of estrogen on men. I think it's, the, I think it's, I think it's very important uh, to understand that estrogen is important for bone health, but certainly for reproductive function as well. You cannot have too high level of an estrogen and you can't have too low of an estrogen. I think estrogen has to be maintained in the sweet spot. And people always ask me what the sweet spot is. I think it's anywhere between 10 to 40. I think that's where it should be maintained. I don't treat less than 60, so up to 60, I'm okay with it. Above 60, I start treating it. The, the part that hurts me the most is the undetectable estrogens. Patients come to me saying, Doc, I went to this men's health center. They gave me testosterone, HCG, and arimidex. They didn't measure any levels. They just gave me all three drugs without checking anything. So like, why are you taking all three? They just gave it to me. And, and if you see their estrogen levels, it's undetectable. Right? And the guy comes to me with erectile dysfunction, poor libido, all his levels look okay and his estrogen is undetectable. And, and so I think that's where it's very important that uh, patients get savvy enough, they understand that estrogen is important. You cannot have undetectable estrogen. It's bad for bone health, bad for erectile function, bad for libido. Very nice study that we did when we were at Baylor where we looked at predictors of libido in, in men who are taking testosterone therapy. And interestingly, we looked at age, FSH, LH, estrogen, and testosterone. We would always think, you're like, oh yeah, testosterone, libido, testosterone, libido. The most important factor that was predictive was actually estrogen. So men who had normal estrogen levels actually had better uh, predictor of libido than even testosterone levels. So very nice study here. Estrogen is important. What we saw in the young college kids that were given testosterone plus aromadex who are translated into the larger population of men that are actually taking testosterone therapy and estrogen is important. So you shouldn't just give testosterone HCG or Imidex to everybody that walks in through the door. I think it's important to measure the levels, make sure it's optimal in a sweet spot and just don't treat randomly. Let's get Let me ask you a question before we sure. move on. I'm sorry that I keep interrupting you. No, but no, no, this, you is, interrupt this is the hottest topic on Excel mail. We've been basically running for 11 years. And if you Google stradialexcelmail.com, there are thousands, thousands of posts. Uh, it's basically, I'm kind of, to be honest with you, bored and over the whole thing because I've been lecturing about estradiol for a long time. And this is a great study. Yours too. Yours actually cost a lot, this, uh, this data, when I say yours, this data, um, a lot of controversy. People are saying, well, this is not true. By the way, the, the units, I guess, are nanograms per deciliter. I wanted to make sure everybody understood that, not picograms per milliliter, right. uh, as we usually use on the, on the, right. on the RAP reports. But the, the, the undetectable uh, estradiol, we have over 400, like, we call it crashed, crashed estradiol. 
over 400 posts, okay? So this is the number one problem I'm seeing out there, like you say. The second thing is, is I'm really concerned, and, and you, I really hope you can clarify that. What, what is too high? I mean, a person, a man with a testosterone of 900, and there are lots of those, right. compared to a man that has 600, um, and the Quest and LabCorp ranges, they're basically very different, and I think they're maxed out. Uh, Quest is maxed out at 30, I think, and LabCorp at 40, something like that. Those lab ranges also were derived from men with lower testosterone than what we usually see in testosterone replacement. So this thing about what is too high, nobody, by the way, nobody has answered that question in clinical trials, nobody. Not even this great study you went through before. Um, so treating people that have 1,000 nanograms of testosterone compared to 600 and looking for the same high value, I think is, is kind of, um, you know, contra, contra it doesn't really make any sense. It's 0.4, 0.4% of testosterone gets aromatized. So the more testosterone, the more estradiol for a reason. So this thing about, you know, is 40 too high, nobody tells you what your, so my second question is, what is your testosterone? So I really think an astrosol is, as you well described, overused, overprescribed, um, um, causing a lot of damage in guys. I mean, I'm seeing reports of decreased penile sensitivity, uh, right. decreased libido. So it, it, it goes beyond that. So I'm going to just stop here because obviously it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those topics that frustrates me as people, new people keep coming in into the Facebook group and into Excel mail with the same estradiol myth that they read somewhere else. And, you know, estrogen, the word estrogen is about females and menopause and, I'm sorry, uh, you know, periods. There is a lot of misconception. It's the same thing with women. You know, we, right. we tend to think women don't need testosterone. They need testosterone. So right. I don't know what um, we can do. I guess a new study would be nice looking at the different uh, estradiol levels with different testosterone dosages and what that means uh, when it comes to the symptoms. But this is very important, and I'm glad you're covering up. So let's move on. I'm so sorry. Just went to. That's great. So I, th so I think the, the point that I never touched upon is what is an optimal testosterone level for a patient. Correct. I mean, yeah. if the guy says, um, if the guy says I want to be 900, I think my immediate question would be, what were you before? You know, and I and I think it's the delta, and and I wish we had the answer all the time because some guys have never seen 900 in their whole life. I think if we, right, they were always 400 to 500 their whole life. And then you start them on testosterone therapy and you put them at 1,000, I think those patients will not do well, right? Because their homeostasis will be altered, axis will be shut down, hematocrit will go up, estrogen will go up, PSA may slightly increase. And so those patients will just not do well. But as the guy that was on 1,000 pretty much his whole life, I think him, leaving him at 600 is probably not a good idea, right? You, he needs to be at 1,000 to feel all of the symptoms and symptom relief from testosterone, uh, low testosterone levels. So this whole concept of what level is important for men, I think it really depends upon where they started with. If the guy has been lean, he's been a bodybuilder his whole life, and his testosterone was high, I think that's, that's the level that he needs to be at. Guys that have never seen testosterone before, I don't think you need to push that guy who was always at 400, 500, and now is at 270, he doesn't need to be at 1,000. Right, because he, if you get him back to 400 to 800, I think he'll be very happy. The estrogen, yes, it's very controversial. Um, I think what we are realizing, especially now with more and more of the female sexual dis dysfunction becoming more popular, um, we're studying a little bit more about female hormone biology. I think we're finally understanding that testosterone is also important in females. Actually, testosterone may be more important in females than estrogen important in males. And so I think we're sort of reversing this whole dogma that we've always uh, talked about, that testosterone is a male hormone, estrogen is a female hormone, guys need more T, females need more E. I think we're sort of like flipping all of that around and trying to relearn the whole uh, testosterone-estrogen ratio, both in females and males, still trying to figure out what the optimal spots are. But all that I can tell you for sure is that estrogen should not be undetectable in men. That's it. I, think, I, think, I don't think that is controversial. I don't think men should be given an astrozole indiscriminately. I think it should be carefully measured to see what the level is and titrated accordingly. And this whole one milligram everyday dose also drives me crazy 
because that will definitely get you undetectable. And so you should just be very careful when you're, uh, when you're getting there. So let's get back to our patient. Our guy is a 26 year old guy. He's been on testosterone and this is, he's azospermic. So what do you do? Remember, this is a panic situation. Wife is unhappy because he is shooting blanks. He's unhappy because he's now coming off testosterone and nothing's happening. It's been two months and he's still azospermic. Remember, somatogenesis in men takes 90 days, so 70, 70 to 90 days. So everything that you intervene will take place uh, in about three months. So this is a nice protocol that we published, I think, two years ago now. Basically, you stop the testosterone and then start them on HCG and Clomid. And this is where I like the Clomid at the higher dose, because not only are you jump-starting the testis, but you're also jump-starting the pituitary gland. And so combining Clomid at 50 milligram every other day with HCG 2000 every other day. And at three months, we check for sperm count. Majority of the men are usually recover at this point and they're very happy they start seeing some sperm. If it doesn't work, then uh, you add FSH along with HCG and stop the clomid. Because people often think, okay, testosterone, you know, exogenous testosterone blocks my testes. Sometimes exogenous testosterone can shut down the brain, right? It will block it such that you don't make the hormones that you're supposed to make from the brain in order to boost the spermatogenesis. So um, we actually have now started studying. This is, this is very new. This is really hot off the press. This got published last month in the Journal of Urology, which is probably the premier journal in the United States in, in, in urology. We started studying serum 17-hydroxy progesterone called 17-OHP. So it's progesterone in men. We're trying to see if we can use this as a biomarker to see how much testosterone is made inside the testis because in guys that want to take both testosterone and HCG, we don't know where the testosterone is coming from. Is it from the uh, exogenous source or how much is made from the testis? And we just published this study showing that uh, if you measure 17 OHP in the blood, right, you don't need to stick a needle inside your testes to get this level. You can just check, check a blood test and it'll tell you uh, how much testosterone is being made inside the testis. So unfortunately we started him on Clomid and uh, and, and, and still it was azospermic at three months, so we quickly added on FSH because his FSH and his LH were still low. And then we started FSH 75 units every other day along with HCG. Every other day we continued it to keep support. And, um, and finally, we saw some sperm at the end of six months. And so this was uh, very, uh, very good news. I think this was fantastic. And they went ahead and froze sperm, did IVF, and they're now pregnant at uh, six months. So obviously very happy story, uh, but certainly there was six months of panic, six months of unhappiness. And so I think it's uh, very important that we, uh, that we are able to offer solutions uh, to couples like these that, uh, that uh, come to us pretty ill-informed. So with that, I'd like to finish. I'd love to obviously uh, take some more questions from Nelson, yeah. but if you guys have any questions, you can, you're welcome to email me. If you want to see me uh, for an appointment, you can email me your name and your phone number, and I'm happy to set it up. With all this COVID crisis, we're actually doing telehealth appointments now. So I'm and through insurance, Medicare and all private insurance companies have approved tele video visits. They were not covered before, but now they are. So regardless of what state anybody is within the United States, we're able to see them uh, through a video visit. Um, and so you're welcome to email me, and I'm happy to set that up for you guys. And of course, uh, uh, Instagram handle, if you want to uh, direct message me as well for the young people that find it very difficult to even email. It's all the chat sensation now. You're welcome to uh, chat with me as well uh, directly. So thanks, Nelson, for the opportunity. Yeah. And, uh, and would love to, any, mo any more questions that you have, I'm happy to discuss them. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks a lot, by the way. You're, you're always great. By the, way, by the way, guys, we have uh, two videos, two more videos of Dr. Ramasamy on excelmail.com. You can actually Google Ramasamy, uh, excelmail.com, and you'll see them. One was about estradiol. Uh, we didn't have uh, slides, but it was a very heated discussion. Another one was about um, Natesto, uh, uh, nasal uh, testosterone product. And obviously this one is gonna be posted also on YouTube and excelmail.com. So you can also leave um, questions there on excelmail.com um, for, for Dr. Ramasamy. I'll be more than happy to forward it to them. I was gonna ask you on the use of FSH. Obviously you added FSH to the protocol for this young person, this young guy. Uh, since he needed that extra help. Um, 
in your in your experience, does insurance pay for the FSH? This is actually kind of an off-label thing for men, right? Or is it only is fertility uh, related uh, indication for FSH paid for? Is this a cash kind of uh, cost to the patient? Because uh, I hear you know fertility is definitely an expensive. Uh, thing for a lot of couples. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So I think majority of the men, Clomid will work. If you're coming off steroids, uh, 80 to 90% of the men, uh, Clomid will work just fine. This man, it didn't, right? We gave him three months and then we finally found out they were still azospermic and his pituitary wasn't kicking in and FSH is needed. So the FSH, if the insurance covers fertility benefits, then FSH would be covered. If the insurance, because this is truly a fertility issue, correct? We're trying to boost spermatogenesis because he has no sperm. If they have infertility benefits, it'll get covered. If they don't have infertility benefits, which unfortunately most insurance plans don't cover, then this has to be a cash um, cash option. Yeah, and you know there are so compounding pharmacies making it, but I think that may stop uh, now with some of new FDA regulations come up uh, on the on that algorithm if you don't mind going back to the um, and I know that was an old paper you you guys published um, at Baylor on um, the algorithm that one yeah the algorithm yeah um, the the ACG climate was that in combination or or uh, just uh, starting with ACG first and then introducing climate how that no, it was in combination so we just published this in two years ago I think but it was, we use it in combination. So Clomid 50 every other day for three months and HCG 2000 units every other day for three months. So combination. So HCG is to boost your own natural testosterone from the testis yeah. and the Clomid is mostly for fertility. Yeah, I hardly see that combo uh, reported on Excel Mail or anywhere else. So that's, that's what I'm asking. Um, well, now you'll but, see it. But you've had, you've had some good results. Uh, oh, yeah. not I mean, in this yeah. person, but... 80 to 90 percent of men will have some sperm at the end of three months and if this doesn't work then we add then we take out the clomid and add the fsh onto the hcg and when it comes to clomid by itself monotherapy and you say a lot of the guys uh, especially the younger the better i think um respond okay when it comes to fertility how about libido do they see an uh, an improvement or or i hear a lot of guys saying that they have no libido on, clom on clomiphene so that's, that's, that's very interesting. So Clomid actually improves all the other symptoms of low testosterone, like lack of energy um, and, 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 and staying up longer, uh, sometimes even erectile function, but it actually is counterproductive to libido. Because if you think about estrogen being important for libido, and I just told you Clomid actually blocks the estrogen receptors on the brain that are important for libido, but will increase FSH and LH, then you know, you're sort of counteracting the same thing. You're increasing the serum testosterone level but you're blocking the estrogen feedback on the, on, on the brain. So men taking Clomid, decreased libido is actually pretty common, commonly seen. And that's because the estrogen feedback gets blocked on the brain. We have a few questions here. Um, so a person here that used to have uh, or had in the past testicular cancer, okay? And uh, can, he's asking, can he add HCG to his protocol? I guess we do have Absolutely. some concerns about the HCG um, being... ACG is actually one way to detect testicular cancer, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a, so it's a bio, it's, it's a marker of testicular cancer, but uh, the, uh, just because it's a marker doesn't mean it cannot be used as a therapy to increase testosterone. So yes, as far as I know, there are no studies that are contraindicated for men who have testicular cancer, treated testicular cancer, to go on HCG to boost their own testosterone. So it's safe. Okay, good. So another question I have, and this is my own question, so obviously I have so many. And most of the time it's because I haven't been able to find a reference or yeah. a paper on the subject. But, you know, I do see, I have a very strong bias uh, for HCG, obviously. I mean, people know yeah. that if you, if you see my work online. Uh, we have no data on HCG and libido um, that I have been able to find. It's all anecdotal, obviously. I think it works for libido. But uh, have you seen any data? Only um, so in the paper that I've showed that we published in which we gave HCG to men with testosterone more than 300, we actually recorded some of the symptoms. And there we actually showed that libido energy improves on just HCG monotherapy. For just men with T greater than 300. Because when the testosterone is more than 300, sometimes insurance companies don't want to approve testosterone therapy. And so in those patients, we were forced to give HCG. And those patients actually responded pretty well to, uh, to libido. So... 
Uh, that's the closest piece. I don't think we recorded that with proper questionnaires, but with sort of yes, no answers on whether it improved or not and how long they stayed on HCG. Uh, but I think that's the closest data that we have to HCG monotherapy trying to improve libido. Yeah, I have a, I propose, I mean, you have a great group, uh, yours and also uh, Lipschultz and Baylor. I propose a study where you have men on testosterone replacement that have yeah. been on, on it for a while. Yeah. And they're kind of complaining that their libido is not as good as it used to be when, when they started. Obviously, there's a honeymoon phase, as yeah. we know. Um, and bringing in HCG and seeing if HCG is actually a booster right. for that libido. So that we need that data because it really is all anecdotal right now. No, that's a good point. That's a very good, that's a very good study to keep the guys on testosterone for six months and then add HCG on it and then see what happens. And yeah. see how symptoms change based on HCG. It's a good point. There is a question here, uh, Dr. Ramasamy, is there data that shows HCG has influence on TSH, thyroid function? Yeah, that's there it. Isn't, there's, no, there's no data that says HCG can block TSH. Um, very high doses of HCG, like 2,000, three times a week, I have seen it actually block FSH and LH, uh, but I've never seen it block TSH, so I think we're okay. Uh, as far as HCG monotherapy for estrogen, actually estrogen was pretty normal in the guys that were taking HCG alone. Your testosterone went up, but your estrogen didn't change. And I think HCG is more physiologic, you know, like as much as it's given from the outside, I think it doesn't disrupt the whole like uh, hypothalamus, pituitary, testicular axis as much. So I think the side effects that you see from increase in PSA, increase in hematocrit, increase in estrogen are not seen as much with the HCG alone than is seen with testosterone and some of the other steroids. And what kind of protocol do you use as monotherapy? I know it depends on the person, but... It's usually 2,000, it's usually 2000 once a week, and uh, I bring them back in three months, and if either they're not happy or the levels are not high, I switch to 2,000 twice a week. Oh, really? That, that's, that's all? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's definitely new uh, information for me. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Uh, I don't have both testicles. Should I add ACG? to my TRT protocol. I'm injecting testosterone cypionate 50 milligrams twice a week, 44 years old, uh, 330 pounds. If you're happy with the symptoms on just testosterone monotherapy, stay on it. I don't think, I don't think you should add ACG. If there are issues with libido, uh, ejaculate volume, and you, think, uh, and you think you need some more supplementation, certainly giving a trial of HCG for three months wouldn't hurt. Good. How about, um, your typical anastrozole uh, dose when you have somebody with high estradiol and on testosterone. So if the estrogen um, is above 60, uh, that's when I start thinking about treating it. If it's 60 to 80, I do one milligram once a week. If it's 80 to 100, I do one milligram twice a week. If it's more than 200, I do one milligram three times a week. Wow, I've never seen anything be above 100. But um, we're also talking about sensitive estradiol by liquid chromatography, or are we talking about immuno assay? No, 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 sensitive, LCMS. And can we, can we talk, for those that don't know, that are watching, the difference between the sensitive estradiol test and the immuno assay? So the immuno, immuno assay is one that was used before, um, five, six years ago. Now, I think most commercial labs, both LabCorp and Quest, have switched to estradiol. Uh, the immunoassay measured didn't measure the pure estradiol E2 format. They measured all of estrogen together. So it was never giving us some, any sort of accurate value on what the receptors are seeing. Uh, now with the LCMS, we're able to measure the E2 or the estradiol fraction, which is the more relevant fraction. And certainly um, that is being measured with the LCMS assay. So if you're going to one of those two labs, I think, I think you're getting the, uh, the appropriate assay, but just make sure that that's what it is. That'd be, uh, there's another question. They're coming. So uh, you tell me when you want to stop because <laughs> we can be here all day. But this is actually a good one. Uh, there's some medical groups who did research on gag repeats. Gag repeats, yes. And the, the, in the individual effect on TRT. Conclusion, more or less, was that people with high gag repeats did not respond as well to TRT compared to people with normal gag repeats. Do you have experiences treating people with TRT who have high CAB repeats? I'm sorry, it's CAB. CAB, yeah, CAB repeats. So these are basically repeats on the androgen receptor um, uh, gene itself. It basically talks about the androgen responsive element and how it is in the tissue. 
the important thing to know is that uh, the, num the CAG repeats varies from tissue to tissue, right? And so in the, in the penis, it could be different. In your muscle, it could be different. In your skin, it could be different. And so testosterone, even though the receptor, the androgen receptor is the same in every tissue, responds differently in different tissues, right? And so it, 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 it so this whole, and all of the uh, repeat study is done from blood. And so it's tough to know exactly what's happening in the tissue unless you obtain tissue biopsies. So I, I wouldn't put too much faith into these studies unless they actually do tissue studies. And we can't do tissue studies unless uh, we do cadaver studies. So I, 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 I wouldn't put too much faith into this. Can you tell us a little bit about the future, about the research on uh, stem cells uh, and, and Leydig cells and all that? Sure, for sure. So we, are, um, we actually obtained a patent to do uh, Leydig stem cells um, under the skin. So we did, we've done animal studies so far. We have basically taken stem cells from uh, mice in the testes and, and process them, multiply them and put them under the skin. Instead of going back and putting it inside the testes, we uh, made a cocktail and put it under the skin. And we, for the first time, showed that even if you put stem cells under the skin, it can make testosterone on its own. And so I think that that is an important discovery. I think it's right now we're doing this, we're not doing the trial in humans, but we've taken stem cells from testis biopsies in humans and, and grafted them under the mice. And so to try to see if those can make testosterone levels and what is the optimal dose? How many cells do we need? Um, and how long can they survive? And how often do these elytic stem cell injections need to get repeated? I think we're trying to answer all of these in an animal model. We're many years away from doing human trials, uh, but at least we're getting there, but I think that's where the future is. Okay, one more question here, and maybe just one more, and we'll yeah, call, more. call it a day, yeah. so yeah. that we can, you can go on with your, I'm sure yeah. you're a busy man. Uh, yeah. The transdermal testosterone creams on the testicles, their circular application of uh, testosterone creams, uh, do you have any experience on that? Um, no, I don't. I don't think it makes a difference. I think it's subcutaneous delivery. Um, I think it needs to get into the bloodstream very well. Um, I, I have no experience at all. I, it shouldn't be used on the scrotum, on the testicles. It should be used on the skin as it's indicated. Uh, I don't think it will make a difference one way or the other uh, as long as it's getting absorbed through the subcutaneous tissue. And I think oh. testosterone is a fat, right? Scrotum doesn't have fat. And so whereas all the other parts of your body has fat. And so I think if you put it in a, if you put it on the testicle, there's no place for it to get absorbed because it's not a fat. It's a steroid, right? It's lipid soluble. And so you need for it to have, see some fat to get absorbed. So I wouldn't use it on the testicle or on the sort of skin, uh, especially with a cream. Yeah, yeah, especially under gel that's alcohol based. But some, right. some guys are reporting increased DHT uh, by using creams, uh, compounded creams. Got it. But I guess this is it, man. I mean, we, we can be here forever, right? Yeah. So um, thank you so much, doctor. I know you're busy. We'll do a few more of these, obviously, because you, you have so much information to share. And uh, stay healthy and stay safe. I hope your family too and everybody out there, okay? So thank awesome. you so much. Appreciate your awesome. time and your, yep. and your information. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.